starting by the skull we have a few questions to answer or a few objectives to achieve by the end of, the, of this lecture and starting by we need to know what are the compositions of the skull bone we have multiple bones forming the skull for example the frontal the parietal the occipital bone and also the mandible maxilla uh, and uh, the <clears throat> zygomatic bone as well and also the of that the bones of the orbit so we need to talk briefly about that how these bones are formed and how they are connected to each other and also we need to talk about multiple views uh, the way you can think about the skull it's a closed box that has six walls so basically we need to talk a little bit about the anterior or looking at the skull from the front or the face as you can see here so anterior view of the skull and if you look laterally or from the sides so we need to get as well a lateral view of the skull and then you might need to get a posterior view of the skull as well and maybe looking from the top that's a superior view or looking from the inferior surface that's an inferior uh, view as well the inferior view is particularly more important because it has as you can see here lots of foramina all right so it has lots of uh, foramina as you can see we need to talk about these foramina and what are their contents and finally when you open the skull and look from the inside you will find that there is um, oh, there are three cranial fossa we need to talk about those and their contents as well so basically we need to talk about the composition of the skull what are the bones from the skull is there any classification that you can classify these bones in um, and also how these bones are formed histologically and then talking about a few views of the skull anterior view lateral view on both sides and posterior view and superior and inferior view as well more importantly about the skull base the foramina and their content and finally the cranial fossa as well and then the second part of the lecture will be talking about the meninges and uh, the meninges these are the coverings of the brain and the meninges are formed of three layers the dura matter the arachnoid matter and the pia matter we'll talk briefly about those three and uh, more importantly about the dura matter including its um how is it formed and the fox reply the anterior cerebelli the nerve supply and the arterial supply of the dura matter and then briefly about arachnoid and pia matter as well so yeah that's a quick summary to today's lecture um, so as I said, um, this is um, a 3D, so I'm going to like move um, around the 2D images and the 3D images and come back to it. So as you can see here, these are bones connected together by sutures. So um, I'll show you 2D images and 3D images uh, throughout the whole uh, lecture and um, it should be clear. Also, you will have this uh, interactive uh, PDF by the end of uh, the lecture it should be available on your um, <clears throat> I think a drive um, or it will be shared with you by the medical school um, so yeah if, if you have any questions of course I'll leave my contact details at the end you can always contact me about these uh, contents so starting by the first question about the composition of the skull um, so it's basically formed of several separate bones that are connected uh, together by immobile joint immobile joint and these joints are called the suture lines all right the suture lines um, so multiple immobile joints that are present between multiple bones however there is only one exception to having a mobile joint and this is the mandibular joint all right so the mandibular joint is the only mobile one among all the other joints which are called the suture lines and we're going to talk about these sutures in a little bit more detail so to identify a few bones on this lateral view of the skull um, you can see that we have um, rather this is the frontal bone frontal means the bone at the front basically so this is the frontal bone or your forehead and then you have this is the parietal bone the parietal bone this is the highest part of your skull and you also have here the temporal bone and at the end there is the occipital bone or at the back and then here you have the zygomatic zygomatic and also the maxillary bone and at the end you have of course the mandible will be sort of here with the head of the mandible and the body uh, as well okay uh, so these are basically the bones of the skulls but we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about that so how would you divide these bones so basically you can have a quick uh, sort of classification 
of these bones into a cranium and the face, all right? A cranium and the face. The cranium is basically where your brain is, all right? So all this area is where your brain is, and this is basically the face or the bones of the face, all right? So uh, cranium and the face. So starting from here, this is, of course, a 2D image, just a diagram from uh, a very lovely Egyptian anatomist called Fawzi Gobala. Um, I would definitely recommend that you uh, look at his books. It's, it's very good, um, uh, but it's only in 2D, all right? So starting by uh, number one is uh, the frontal bone, as mentioned early, and number two is called the parietal, the parietal uh, bone, and three, of course, the occipital uh, bone as well. Four is the temporal bone, and um, you have five here. This is called the greater wing of the sphenoid, but let's for now call it the sphenoid bone, all right? This is the sphenoid bone. Of course, nine is the mandible, and uh, eight is your maxilla. Eight is the maxilla. And seven is the zygomatic bone, and six are the nasal bones. All right. So, like I said, you can classify it into uh, the um, bones of the cranium, and these are the temporal bone, the sphenoid bone, occipital bone, parietal bone, frontal bone, and the bones of the face. This is the maxilla, the zygomatic bone, the nasal bones, and also the mandible. Uh, as you can see, all these bones are connected together by immobile joints, and these immobile joints are called suture lines, all right? You can give some names to these sutures. Uh, so basically, uh, on the top, you have here a suture that's uh, going, you know, sort of coronal um, in the basic anatomy or your general anatomy. So this is going to be uh, named as coronal suture, coronal suture, all right? And you have multiple other sutures, for example, on the back, this is uh, it's going to be explained later in detail, but this is called the lambdoid suture, okay? And then you have uh, here um, uh, a suture, another suture between the parietal bone and the temporal bone. You can call it the temporoparietal suture, all right? The temporoparietal uh, suture. Um, and also another one between the sphenoid and the temporal bone. Again, you can just take the two names of the bones and then call it a suture. All right. Um, so this is a starting by just a quick classification of the bones of the skulls, but we're going to go into detail about the different views of the skull. However, um, we didn't mention those three um, because they are not apparent on this 2D imaging. There is something called the theme of the vumer, which is so basically the nose is, is sort of like a big box inside the skull. All right, so this is the anterior apertia or the frontal opening of the nose, and on the back of the nose there is a bone called the vumer. All right, and of course on the uh, roof of the nose you have the palatine bones. Uh, sorry, in the floor of the nose you have the palatine bones. And you have some conchi inside the nose called the inferior concha as well. Okay, so the skull bones are formed, and this is a quite an important diagram. I think we're going to come back to it multiple times. Um, so the skull bones um, are formed of two tables, all right? Two tables, uh, and in between a spongy cancellous bone, all right? So what does this mean? So you have for each skull bone, you have an outer table and an inner table, and in between there is some sort of a spongy or cancellous bone, all right? So basically, if I want to draw two, take a, a section in both parietal bone and the frontal bone, for example, and in between there is the coronal suture. So you're going to find it in that manner. You're going to find that you have the, um, the frontal bone as uh, an outer table and an inner table, and in between there is cancellous bone, and the parietal bone, again, outer table, inner table, and in between there is cancellous bone, and they are connected together by a suture right there. All right? So it, it, it's sort of explained in here. Uh, so you do have uh, the, the spongy bone or uh, the cancellous bone in the middle is called the um, diploe, diploe. All right? So you have an outer table right there, an inner table right there, and in between there is the diploe, right? So external and internal table separated by a layer of a spongy bone called the diploe. These bones are covered by periosteum and the outer 
and the inner surface. All right. Well, to be more accurate, and this is going to be explained in the meninges. So let's say if this is a bone which has outer and inner table, and in between there is cancellous bone. On the outer covers there is a pericranium, all right, or a periosteum, just right there. And on the inner surface there is the endosteal layer, all right, the endosteal, the uh, the periosteal layer of the um, the the dura mater, all right. This is the periosteal layer of the dura mater. So we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail um, at the end of this lecture. So let's not rush to that. Okay. So, so uh, if we're going to go to um, sort of an anterior uh, view of the skull, anterior view of the skull, um, these questions, I like to leave them to the end. But anterior view, basically, you're looking from the front. And we need to identify uh, these bones at the front of um, the skull or at the anterior surface. So as you can see here, you have multiple different bones in that 2D uh, image, including number one as the nasal bones, all right? Uh, and number two, something called the nasian, all right? Something called the nasian. And going to uh, number three, something called metopic suture. I wouldn't worry about that, to be fair. But it's important to identify the main bones. You have one as the nasal bone on both sides, and then this suture, not more suture, this sort of elevation or, uh, is called the nasian. And then going to this one, the big one in the front, which we said early, that's the frontal uh, bone. And then uh, there is on both sides, on the frontal bone, there is something called the frontal eminence. An eminence, basically, an elevation, and to be able to feel that in yourself, frontal eminence, but this is mainly the frontal bone. Um, and then, of course, this is the orbit. Number nine is the orbit on both sides. So this is the orbit, and this is the orbit. Just above the orbit, there is something called the glabella, all right, the glabella, just above uh, the orbit. And... Um, in, uh, uh, just below the orbit as well, there is a small foramen um, right there, which is called the infraorbital foramen, infraorbital foramen, just below the orbit. And um, also uh, on the upper part of the orbit, you can see there is a small elevation here. It's called the superior orbital, uh, you know, you can call it um, uh, supraorbital notch, not a foramen, because it's not a complete circle, all right? So this bit is called the supraorbital notch, okay? Uh, and this is, of course, anterior nasal aperture or the entrance to the nose, okay? Anterior nasal aperture. But if I'm gonna go back to this one, so you have lots of structures in there. What are the bones on the anterior surface of the skull? Or what are the bones that you can see in the face and the anterior part of the uh, cranium? So you can see here, this is the frontal bone with two eminences right there, and this is the supraorbital notch, which we explained early on both sides. Of course, this is the orbit on both sides, and just below the orbit, there is the infraorbital foramen. And the bones, again, you have the frontal bone, and also you have the nasal bones right there, and also the zygomatic bone. This is zygomatic bone, and also the maxillary, the maxillary bone as well, and finally, the mandible finally, the mandible. Of course, all of these will be coming together by sort of sutures. So for example, between the zygomatic and the maxillary bone, there are going to be a suture called the zygomatical, zygomatical maxillary suture. Zygomatical maxillary suture. Again, this is the, uh, this is the, the whole bone right there. It's called the zygomatic bone, right? And let me just uh, circulate that one. So this is the zygomatic bone, and of course, uh, this one is going, the maxilla going all the way up. All right, so let's identify what is this suture. For example, this is a suture between the frontal bone and the zygomatic bone. It's going to be called the frontozygomatic suture, the frontozygomatic suture, all right? Um, this is, of course, the maxilla going all the way up. This part of the maxilla going toward the frontal bone is called the frontal process of the maxillary bone. The frontal process of the maxillary bone. 
Um, okay, so these are the bones and the front of the face. You have um, one, the zygomatic bone, two, the maxillary bone, and on the top, frontal bone and nasal bones as well. And of course, the orpet will be there as well, the anterior nasal aperture, and finally, the mandible will be at the lower end. They are connected together by sutures that you can just use the two bones uh, that are coming together in that suture and name them accordingly. All right, and we use that 2D, 2D image. All right, but there are multiple other structures just to identify, um, and I'm going to go through this one again. Um, it's very similar to what we just explained earlier. So this is, of course, the orbit, orbit on both sides. Okay, so just above the orbit, there is the supraorbital foramen or a notch. All right, so most of the times it is just a notch, uh, but sometimes it is a uh, 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 foramen, all right? So uh, it depends how it looks like on the diagram or on the actual patient. So see, this is supraorbital uh, foramen. Two, of course, is a nasal bone, as you can see here on both sides. And three, this is a suture. Uh, what is it coming? Or um, it, it, it's, of course, it's coming between two bones. Um, so you can see that this one, which is number 16, is the maxilla, all right? This is the maxilla. And this one right there is the frontal bone. So how are you going to call the suture? This is a frontal maxillary suture. Frontal maxillary suture. Of course, you can see in the maxilla that there is a foramen, which is number 11. And this is the infraorbital, the infraorbital uh, foramen as well. And if we go a little bit more in detail on number 5, and the diagram is pointing, or the arrow is pointing to this one, which is called the superior orbital margin. And um, let's go to number six, is basically the lateral orbital margin. Number six is the lateral orbital margin. So this is superior orbital margin, lateral orbital margin, and of course eight would be the inferior orbital margin, and four would be the medial orbital margin. As easy as that, just direction, superior, inferior, and lateral and medial as well okay there is a very tiny suture right there uh, again we need to identify what bones is it connecting between so it's connecting between the frontal bone and the zygomatic bone so that would be frontal zygomatic suture as easy as that frontal zygomatic suture all right there is a foramen here in the zygomatic bone it's called the zygomatical facial foramen and of course, 10 will be the zygomatic bone, which is just right there, okay? Um, so yeah, as easy as, as that, um, this is the maxilla, and on the maxilla, you have uh, sort of um, it's something called the carina eminence, and also the number 12 is something called the incisive um, uh, fossa, uh, and 11 is, uh, we talked about 11, already uh, 13 for example is called the anterior nasal the spine i wouldn't worry about this uh, for now but mainly you have the in the front of the face or the anterior uh, view of the skull you have the frontal bone all right the frontal bone will have a few uh, things to identify the frontal eminence okay the frontal eminence maybe the glabella maybe the nasion maybe the supraorbital um, or superior orbital foramen, and maybe you can talk about two sutures, frontal zygomatic suture and the frontal maxillary suture, remember, frontal maxillary and frontal zygomatic suture, I don't know that the frontal bone will form the superior margin or the superior border or the superior boundary of the orbit, okay, and then we talked about maxilla as well, and we know that the maxilla will have the infraorbital foramen and the nasal aperture or the anterior nasal aperture will be related to it as well. And finally, uh, there is a zygomatic bone with the zygomaticofacial foramen and the suture with the frontal bone. Another diagram which is a little bit more complete here. So one is frontal bone. And you know, remember that small notch that could be a foramen sometimes. So this is the supra orbital notch. Three is, of course, the nasal bone, and five is the anterior nasal aperture, and six is the maxilla, four is the zygomatical facial foramen, 
zygomatical facial foramen, and then of course seven is the mandible, and you have a suture there between the frontal and zygomatic bone called the frontal zygomatic uh, uh, um, uh, suture. Another suture there between the maxilla and a frontal bone called uh, the frontal maxillary uh, suture as well. Active uh, view and a 3D view as you can see here. So this is the front of the skull or basically you have part of the cranium up there and part of the face down there. So this is the frontal bone as you can see here with two eminences on both sides. This is the frontal eminence and another elevation right there called a glabella on both sides. You can see that the frontal bone called uh, uh, represent the roof of the orbit. Of course, this is the orbit, and the roof of the orbit is formed of the frontal bone, as you can see right there. This is the frontal bone forming the roof of this orbit, and that's again the frontal bone forming the roof of the other orbit. All right, uh, the frontal bone coming all the way down uh, to meet with the nasal bones right there, and here you will have the nasian. Okay, this is the nasian, and again the frontal bone will meet this bone, which is called the maxilla, the maxilla in a suture cord, uh, the frontal maxillary suture, just right there, all right, frontal maxillary suture. On the other side, you have, this is the zygomatic bone, with, um, of course, this is the zygomatic arch, uh, and moving all the way up with another process to meet the uh, frontal uh, bone in a suture called the frontal uh, zygomatic or the zygomatical frontal suture you can call it the way you like and yeah so we explained here frontal bone and this is the orbit with as you can see the, this little bit that we explained in the to do images this is the supra orbital notch that's the orbit and this is the infra orbital foramen nasal bones and nasal right there, and this is the anterior nasal aperture, and of course this is the maxilla, and down there at the end this is the mandible. Um, we talked about that suture, and we talked about that suture, and we talked about the nasion and the glabella on both sides, and that completes the anterior surface uh, of the skull, anterior view of the skull questions at the beginning of your uh, notes. Um, the first question is asking about the boundaries of the orbit. So as you can see, the orbit is sort of conical in shape, and you can see that the superior margin of the, the orbit is formed by the frontal bone, and laterally, you can see the zygomatic bone very nicely forming the lateral border of the orbital margin. This is the lateral border formed by the uh, um, zygomatic bone. The inferior uh, margin is formed by the uh, maxilla, as you can see here, and of course the medial uh, margin would be sort of the frontal bone again coming uh, medially, all right, and also the zygomatic process, uh, sorry, the maxillary process. So maxillary process here, there is, um, this is called the frontal process of the maxilla, uh, and also uh, the frontal uh, bone right there, all right? So the margins of the orbit, frontal bone, zygomatic bone, and below is the maxilla, and medial is maxillary process, and also the frontal bone as well. That's the first question. The second question is asking about the components of the nasal cavity. The two um, nasal bones form a bridge of the nose. So this is basically the nasal bridge, which is formed by the two nasal bone and the lower border um, with the maxilla as you can see here this is the maxilla and this is the lower border of the um, nasal bridge forming the anterior nasal aperture the anterior nasal aperture and the cavity is divided into two uh, by a bony nasal septum as you can see in the middle there is a nasal uh, septum actually if we move that further it will be a little bit more clear. So you can see in the middle there is a big nasal septum dividing the nasal cavity. So of course this is the nasal bridge and this is here a nasal septum dividing the nasal cavity into two cavities instead of one cavity. Um, and there is something called the superior middle concha 
which are basically shelves on the lateral boundary of the nose and relate to the ethmoid bone, which is sort of representing the medial order of the orbit. All right, uh, this is the ethmoid bone rather. Okay, uh, so these this is the second question. The third question is asking about the mandible. The mandible is um, or the lower jaw is basically from one to formed of a horizontal body. This is the body of the mandible, and this is the ramus of the mandible. So two vertical rami. This is one ramus on this side, another ramus on the other side, and a horizontal sort of a horizontal body of the mandible. All right. Summary: frontal bone, and this is the orbit with its boundaries. You know the boundaries of the nasal cavity, and you know how is the um, mandible formed. All right. Moving forward, we're going to explain the lateral view of the skull. And as you can see here, it's basically the same bones um, that we, we talked about before. So we have here, this is the frontal bone, the frontal bone. And of course, that will be the parietal bone. And you have here, this is the occipital bone. And of course, you have the temporal bone. And here, you have the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. And this is the zygomatic bone, and of course, that's the maxillary bone. Um, so uh, the sutures that are present in between, which we talked briefly about, remember, you have uh, the zygomatic bone coming together with the frontal bone uh, through a suture called the frontozygomatic suture, right? And you have the frontal bone coming with the parietal bone on a suture called the coronal suture. And the parietal bone coming with the occipital bone, uh, forming a lambdoid suture, or forming on the shape of a lambda, all right? So a lambdoid suture. There are other things on the lateral uh, border as well, or the lateral surface of the skull as well. As you can see, number six is the external auditory canal, or the external auditory meatus. And just below it, there is the stylomastoid, uh, the styloid process, the styloid process. Number five is the styloid process, and number seven is the mastoid uh, um, process, right? So this is five styloid process, and number seven is the mastoid process, just behind the external auditory meatus, which is uh, number six, okay? And um, yeah, and, and then you have, this is called the pterygoid bone, so this is the lateral pterygoid, all right, something called the lateral pterygoid, number three. And of course, n number two would be the maxilla. And one, something called the pterygopalatine fossa, a very small fossa just right there, which we're going to talk about its boundaries, pterygopalatine fossa, okay? Um, yeah, so just briefly, a frontal bone coming with the parietal bone through uh, the coronal suture, parietal bone coming with the occipital bone through the lambdoid suture, and temporal bone uh, uh, coming um, with the parietal bone as well for formation of that suture as well. Greater wing of the sphenoid with the zygomatic right there. And also you have the styloid process, the mastoid process, and of course the external auditory meatus on the lateral border. Okay, so the, the frontal bone, the conclusion here, the frontal bone, forms the anterior part and the side of the skull, and it articulates with the parietal bone at the coronal sutures, which we explained here, and the parietal bone from the sides and the roof of the cranium. And we're going to have a superior view as well, and it's gonna be really clear what we're talking about. And articulate with each other in the midline on a sagittal suture. This is gonna be clear on a superior view, which we're going to have in a minute. And also they articulate with the occipital bone through the lambdoid suture, which we talked about here. All right, cool. Um, there is one more thing to mention here. Um, so as you can see from, uh, there is uh, two lines uh, coming together right there on the temporal, just above the temporal bone. This is called superior temporal line, and this is called the inferior temporal line. It, they start as a single line, just from the uh, zygomatic bone and continue all the way up as two separate lines called superior temporal line and inferior uh, temporal line. Uh, 
there are a few other clinically oriented questions to, to answer here. And the first question is something called the terion. And the terion is that H shape. As you can see here, there is an H shape structure coming in here. This one and this one coming together in the midline. So this is the H shape meeting between four bones. And all you need to do is just to name those four bones. So you have the parietal bone, the frontal bone, and the greater wing of the sphenoid and the temporal bone coming together forming a terion. And the terion has a, a very important clinical significance. So as you can see here again, uh, you have the frontal bone on the front and then temporal bone. It's uh, just two men. So you have frontal bone and then temporal bone and then, uh, sorry, parietal bone and temporal bone. And this is the greater wing of the sphenoid. And you have the terion just right there. This area is called the terion. Of course, you can see here, this is the superior temporal line. Okay. And this is called the squamoid suture. Squamoid suture. All right. And of course, this is the uh, zygomatic bone or the zygoma. And that's the maxilla. Of course, this is the external litrometus. And that's the styloid process. And this is the mastoid process occipital bone and this is the lambdoid suture all right it's very similar on the back there is something called the asterion all right but we don't care about the asterion that much more importantly is the terion the terion has clinical significance as it represents so basically on the inner surface on the inner surface of that terion there is an artery called the middle meningeal artery which we're going to explain later on in this lecture and this artery is basically responsible for an extradural hematoma, okay? And the other significance, it represents lots of approaches for neurosurgeons called the terional approach, all right? And this is basically to access the circle of Wellers, which I'm sure will be explained at some point in neuroanatomy, all right? Fine. For what we just mentioned, so this is the lateral... Um, surface of the skull or a lateral view of the skull you have multiple bones forming it first of all the frontal bone right there and that's this is the parietal bone coming together on a suture called the uh, coronal suture let's close that suture to be a little bit more realistic so this is the coronal suture uh, in the front just right there and then the parietal bone coming with the occipital bone on a lambdoid suture so this is the lambda suture, which is that Y-shaped suture. And then you have the temporal bone with this squamoid suture just right there. And then the greater wing of the sphenoid as well. And of course, zygomatic bone is still there uh, in that, you know, uh, sutures. You have two sutures here. This is the zygomatic arch. And of course, this is the frontal zygomatic or the zygomatic or frontal suture right there. So frontal bone, parietal bone, occipital bone temporal bone, greater wing of the sphenoid, and also zygomatic bone. There is a few clinically uh, important questions. First one is the terion, and it's an H-shaped suture that represents the meeting of four bones, and these are the frontal, parietal, greater wing of the sphenoid, and also the temporal bone. It's very clinically important because it represents um, basically an approach for the neurosurgeons called the terion and approach to access circle of Willis and also it's important because the middle meningeal artery runs on the inner surface of that terion and injury at this area can lead to an extradural hematoma all right um, a few more things to mention as well um, so we, we explained very um, rapidly the uh, temporal lines as well uh, I think it's not really clear on that 3d model but basically from this area appears a little bit of an elevation called the temporal line and then it divides into superior and inferior temporal lines all the way back all right so there are two more questions what is the location of the temporal fossa the temporal fossa is uh, basically um, what you need to do is to identify the superior and the inferior temporal lines which we just mentioned they start from the zygomatic process of the frontal bone, which is this one, and you will find a single line at the beginning that divides into two separate lines backwardly, and just inferior to these lines would be the, the temporal fossa. 
So all of this area is called the temporal fossa and the temporalis muscle will be just right there. All right. Okay. Um, there is something as well called the pterygopalatine fossa. I'm not really sure if I'll be able to get it here. Uh, but uh, the pterygoid, uh, pterygopalatine fossa, I think it is just um, just to be inferior to the orbit. So the location of it is just inferior to the orbit. So you have the orbit right there. So it will be sort of here. I can just remove bones from these three model, uh, but uh, you have the pterygopalatine fossa sort of in that area, all right? And the pterygopalatine fossa uh, can go laterally to the infratemporal fossa through the pterygomaxillary fascia, and medially will be connected to the nasal cavity through the sphenopalatine foramen, which I'm sorry, I can't really show it to you on that model, and can go superiorly to the um, the skull through something called foramen rotundum, and that will be explained later on. And foramen rotundum um, appears better from the inner uh, surface of the skull, which I'm gonna show it to you later on. And finally, you can communicate anteriorly with the orbit through the inferior orbital fascia, the inferior orbital fascia, and you can see the inferior orbital fascia is just this one, right? So that will be the pterygopalatine fossa, just uh, right there, that area, okay? This is the pterygopalatine fossa, okay? So it can communicate in four directions, to the infratemporal fossa, and to the orbit through the inferior orbital fascia, to the nasal cavity through the uh, sphenopalatine foramen, and finally to the itself through uh, foramen rotundum, all right? So this is a lateral view of the skull. So next is a posterior view of the skull, and as you can see that we have three big bones on the posterior view, uh, or actually four. Uh, one of them is paired, so this one is the parietal bone on both sides, and then you have the occipital bone as well. Uh, this is the occipital bone. And finally, there is a tiny one that you can see here, uh, and this is actually part of the temporal bone, uh, and this is the mastery process, all right, which is present in the temporal bone. This is going to be even more clear on the 3D model. But let's identify the few structures uh, that is present on this diagram. So you have the meeting between the two um, parietal bones, this one and this one, in the middle. There is a suture, which is called the superior sagittal suture, all right? or actually just uh, the sagittal suture, all right, sagittal suture, and just below to that suture, you have the superior sagittal sinus. Um, and then uh, on both sides, you can see multiple foramina uh, that is present, that is called the parietal foramen, all right, this is number 15. And then the meeting between that suture and the other suture, which is this one, the other suture is called the lambdoid suture, all right, lambdoid suture, and the meeting between them is called the lambda, all right? So this is the lambda, okay? And then uh, moving a little bit more backward on the occipital bone, so one is basically something called the squamous part of the occipital bone, and two is called the highest nuca line, the highest nuca line, and three is called the superior nuca line, and four is the inferior nuca line, these basically represent attachment to muscles on the back of your neck. And then you have five external occipital protuberance. Protuberance is basically an elevation. I'm sure that you have this in your terminology in basic uh, um, introduction to medical school in your first year. And then number six is called a crest. Uh, this is the external occipital crest, external occipital crest. And you can see number eight here, this is the mastoid process. Eight is mastoid process, and seven is a mastoid notch, okay? Mastoid notch, and nine is a mastoid foramen, okay? Nine is a mastoid foramen. And then you have 10. Uh, remember, we explained the terion previously, but that will be the asterion, which is very similar to it. But in the back, 11 is the lambdoid suture, and 12 is um, um, basically a suture bone. So sometimes you have the bony part of uh, that suture that splits as it does here. 
and then it will have a sort of a bone in the middle okay so the posterior view of the skull you have two parietal bones meeting together in um, a midline forming the su the um, sagittal suture and the two parietal bones will meet the occipital bone the squamous part of the occipital bone forming the lambdoid suture and they meet here to form the lambda they meet on the other side to form the asterion and then you have the squamous part of the occipital bone having the highest nuchal line, superior nuchal line, inferior nuchal line, and the external occipital crest and the external occipital protuberance. All right? And then you have the mastoid process, the mastoid notch, and finally the um, foramen at the end, which is called the uh, styloid foramen. All right? Styloid foramen. Okay? Fine. Um, so that's the posterior view. We're going to have a look as well at the 3D model. At 3D model, you can identify that you have two parietal bone meeting in the middle, forming the sagittal suture. And those two parietal bone uh, meeting the squamous part of the occipital bone, forming the lambdoid suture. Uh, bilaterally, as you can see here, this is a Y-shaped uh, lambdoid suture. And then you have on that side, this is the, the mastoid process, mastoid process. And that's a mastoid notch. So this is mastoid process, mastoid notch. Mastoid foramen is not really clear here, but usually it will come where my cursor is. And then on the back, you have external occipital protuberance, external occipital crest. You have the, the highest nuchal line, which is a little bit higher, is not clear in that 3D model. And then superior nuchal line and inferior nuchal line at the end, nuchal crest and external occipital crest and external occipital protuberance as well, all right? So actually the foramen is quite clear on this side. This is the um, the, the, mastoid, the styloid foramen, the stylomastoid foramen, you can call it this way. And you have the notch just right there. And the styloid process is here. And the mastoid process is basically here. So, I mean, now you, you're able to identify that the temporal bone, okay, is formed of a squamous part, which is this part. That's why we call this area squamoid suture. And it has a petrous part, but that would be from the inside. And I'm going to show it to you when we go to the base of the skull. And it also has three processes, okay? Three processes, and this include uh, that process, the zygomatic arch and the styloid process, and also mastoid process, okay? Long story short, two parietal bones coming in the middle from an sagittal suture, meeting inferiorly the squamous part of the occipital bone forming lambda with suture in the middle it would be lambda on the other side would be asterion you have a uh, mastoid notch mastoid process and also the stylomastoid foramen on the mastoid bone okay so that's the posterior view of the skull Next is superior view of the skull, which is quite similar to the others because we basically covered the important bones. And as you can see, number one is uh, the frontal bone and it comes um, to meet the two parietal bones, which is eight and this number on the other side. This is parietal bone to form a suture called the coronal suture. And uh, as you can see, the two parietal bones meet in the middle on the superior uh, or, or the sagittal uh, suture and on both sides you have a uh, parietal foramina and they meet the two occipital the occipital bone the squamous part of the occipital bone on the back as um, the lambdoid suture and of course you know that 11 will be a, a lambda all right okay um number 10 on both sides is something called the parietal eminence Remember the frontal eminence that we talked about, it's the same thing, which is some sort of a protuberance or an elevation of the parietal bone on both uh, sides. So this is superior view of the skull, and we're going to go now to the 3D model just to identify the same structures again. The superior view of the skull, you can see the frontal bone meeting two parietal bones on the uh, coronal suture and two parietal bones meeting in the middle on the sagittal suture and this will meet the lambda suture uh, posteriorly between the occipital bone and the two parietal bones. This is called 
the lambda, the meeting between the sagittal suture and the lambda suture, and this is called the bregma, the meeting between the coronal suture and the sagittal suture as well, and these areas are called the uh, parietal eminence, okay? We need to identify the following structures and all um, and also the structure that go through them. So starting by number three, this is going to be the carotid canal, and we're going to cover what passes through them now. But mainly, what we need to mention in the carotid canal is internal parotid artery. Number nine, on this side, this nine is uh, is basically the foramen lastrum. Foramen lastrum. Mm -hmm. So this is this is going to be foramen lastrum. Okay, and foramen lastrum is, is, is basically, is, if it's like a cavity like that, so the, the inferior part of the foramen lastrum will be obliterated by fibrocartilaginous material, and the superior part will have the internal carotid artery passing just above the foramen, but not actually inside the foramen lastrum. So the internal carotid artery will go from here, and then will pass just over the uh, foramen lastrum as well. Okay, so we said foramen lastrum and the carotid artery, uh, and the carotid canal, uh, so this is number three, the carotid canal, and number nine is foramen lastrum. Obviously, number ten will be the foramen magnum, which is the biggest one, and foramen magnum is where uh, the uh, medulla ends, so basically you'll have here the medulla will end, and the spinal cord will start, okay? You have some arteries, you have the vertebral artery will enter through this foramen, and you have the spinal artery, which is a branch of actually the vertebral artery, will go down to supply the spinal cord as well. And you have the apical ligament of the odontoid pig, and this will be covered in the, um, um, uh, the spine part as well, okay? Here, on the side of the foramen magnum, you have a small canal on this side, a small canal. So this canal is called the hypoglossal canal, and the, from its name, it contains the hypoglossal nerve, okay? So this is the hypoglossal canal, which contains the hypoglossal nerve. What about number 20, just lateral to the canal? So obviously the canal is from here and coming out from here as well. And on this side, just lateral to the canal, you have a big, uh, quite big um, foramen just behind the carotid um, uh, canal as well. That's called internal jugular, uh, continue the internal jugular vein. So this is jugular foramen, okay? That's jugular foramen as well. And obviously, the jugular foramen will contain internal jugular vein and uh, the nerve 9, 10th, 11th nerve, and the petrosal sinus uh, uh, as well, or the sigmoid sinus as well, will continue at internal jugular vein. Okay? So these are the structures on this side. I'm not sure if there's anything else to cover. Maybe number 11, and this is foramen oval, and we'll come into that as well. Maybe number 12 is foramen spinosum foramen spinosum as well. So these are the foramens from the inferior surface of the skull. Magnum is quite, is quite evident, and just beside it is hypoglossal canal. Just lateral to hypoglossal canal is the jugular foramen, and just anterior to them is the carotid canal. A big one, which is irregular in shape, number nine, this is the um, foramen lastrum, and an oval foramen, so foramen oval, Small foramen beside it, this is foramen spinosum. The structures passing through it, we'll come into it now. So starting by carotid canal, that was number three, and it contains mainly, what you need to mention is the internal carotid artery, but otherwise, I'd be very happy to cover the others as well. But to be honest, what I prefer remembering is the internal carotid artery. Two, you have foramen lastrum, and we said it's two parts. You have a cartilaginous part, uh, which is obliterated, and the other part which contains the carotid artery, the internal carotid artery. You have foramen magnum as well, and we mentioned you have the medulla oblongata um, will end, and the spinal cord will begin, and you, this reminds you by spinal arteries, and this reminds you by vertebral artery, and A reminds you with apical ligament, which is attached to the odontoid pig as well. You have hypoglossal canal, we mentioned at number 15, remember that canal from foramen magnum, small canal in here, that ends right there, which contains hypoglossal nerve. Number, 
jugular foramen as well. And jugular foramen, it, um, it contains the internal jugular vein. What form of that is the sigmoid sinus, and then 9, 10, 11 nerves, okay? Great. Um, maybe we didn't mention 47, this one, it, the stylomastoid foramen. So obviously you have here 26 is mastoid process, and just to interior to it, the stylomastoid foramen. And this contains the stylomastoid artery, and the fascia nerve leaves the cranial cavity through that foramen, stylomastoid foramen. Okay, so we're going to now cover the, the, the same foramina, but from the inside rather than from the outside. So this, you, now you're currently inside the cranial cavity. Number 11, again, that will be the um, uh, foramen magnum, foramen magnum, and we mentioned what was contained in it. You have the uh, medulla oblongata, spinal cord, spinal artery, vertebral artery, and apical ligament. 27, remember that is small canal which opens on the outer side. So 27 will be the hypoglossal canal, and the hypoglossal canal contains hypoglossal nerve, okay? Hypoglossal canal contains hypoglossal nerve. All right, so number 30, if you remember, just lateral to the canal, but from the other side, that will be the um, jugular foramen, okay? Jugular foramen. Great. Um, looking a little bit closer, you know, this is, this is an oval structure on this side, small structure beside it as well. So number 12 on the other side will be the foramen oval, and 12, uh, 14 will be foramen spinosum, okay? And I'm going to mention the structures in a bit. It's quite easy to remember the oval one, which um, goes with the name as well, O is otic ganglion, and V3, and uh, ascending meningeal. We're going to come to that as well in a minute. Spinosum usually contains middle meningeal artery. Okay, this there is another foramen here just below the clinoid process, which is called the um, uh, foramen rotundum. Foramen rotundum. Okay, this is foramen rotundum as well. Obviously, one is the anterior clinoid process, anterior clinoid process. Okay. And you have 34 is the optic canal, and from the name, it contains the optic nerve. Four is something called the clivus, it's just the bone. And here, this area, so let me just uh, highlight it to you, and then I'm going to delete that. So this area, we're talking about the, the, cell, the um, cellar area, or the cellar tersicle, or where the pituitary lies, okay? So 38 is the cellar tersica. this is the cellar tersica. Okay, and um, um, you have number 8 and number 40 as well. So 40 is something anterior to it, and uh, 8 is posterior to it. So 8 is going to be the dorsum cellar, dorsum cellar, and 40 is the tuperculum. It looks like a tubercle, so it's called tuperculum cellar as well. Okay, so you have cellar tersica and tuperculum. Cella just intuitive. 42, which is a little bit subtle, it's, it's a canal, but it's, it's actually a fissure or a canal to be sort of like that. This is just a 2D image trying to show a 3D structure, so it's quite difficult to do that. But that will be the superior orbital fissure, okay? And it contains loads of structures that we're coming to, 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 we're going to mention as well, okay? So I think, yeah, that's a good coverage to most of what need to be covered in this in this picture. So obviously here you have the internal occipital protuberance number 29. On both sides you have the transverse sinus will be lying on the 23rd. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so so maybe we can say uh, 43 is something called the tegment tympani. Tegment tympani. And it's an important structure as well because this is where the um, uh, infection from the middle ear, which lies just below it, uh, can, can spread to the brain. 41, this is the temporal bone. This one is the temporal bone. So that's called the squamous part of temporal bone. 37, this is the petrus. So that's the petrus part of temporal bone. And this is obviously the superior border of petrus part of temporal bone. And that th this looks like an impression in here. So that's an impression for superior petrosal 
sinus. And it's quite tricky to try to remember this one, but with practice, it will uh, you'll be able to remember all of them. So we mentioned anterior glomerular process, number one, remember that. We mentioned the clivus, we mentioned dorsum cella, and petrous part of temporal bone, and squamous part of temporal bone, and tegment tympani of 43. Here, we mentioned for magnum and the contents of that, and we said it multiple times. Oval, we mentioned oval, it comes with the word oval as well. So O is for otic ganglion. V3, okay, so V3 means, reminds you of, of cranial nerve number five and the third branch. So that would be the mandibular branch of trigeminal nerve. A is called accessory meningeal artery, accessory meningeal artery. And you have um, L is lesser petrosal nerve and also emissary vein. So usually you confuse them. So you have an artery, nerve, and vein. So one is structure of each, and it goes like A and B. Okay. Rotundum, and we mentioned rotundum number 13, if you remember that, and that contains an axillary nerve, or now we're talking about V2. That's V2 or maxillary nerve. Okay. And, and so remember V3 was oval and V2 is rotundum. Spinosum that contains middle meningeal artery. We mentioned it. Hypoglossal canal contains hypoglossal nerve, jugular foramen 9, 10, 11, and inferior petrosal sinus or sigmoid sinus with internal jugular vein as a continuation to it as well. Optic canal, we mentioned it contains optic nerve. Superior orbital fissure, the very subtle structure, you know, the 2D structure and the 3D image. So uh, that contains loads of nerves. So try to remember it like that. You have the third and the fourth and the sixth nerve. Okay. And you have some other branches from the ophthalmic nerve. Okay. And the ophthalmic, which is V1. So now we get to V1. So ophthalmic will give three branches like nasociliary branch and frontal branch and also lacrimal branch as well. Okay. So these are the structures that pass in here. And uh, finally, you have the superior ophthalmic vein as well, can pass through um, the superior orbital fissure. So lots of seven structures that pass in here, and we need to cover all of them. Okay. All right, this might be repeated a little bit, but I'm going to um, show a few structures on uh, this um, skull, the base of the skull from the internal surface again. So looking at this part, okay, so this is the anterior cranial fossa, and we can talk about the boundaries of the anterior cranial fossa, which are formed here. This is the, uh, basically the frontal bone on the front, and you have the wing of the sphenoid, which is the lesser wing of the sphenoid bilaterally, and that will be the uh, anterior cranial fossa. And you have in the anterior cranial fossa as well, this is called the cresta galli, which will be explained later on. It shows an attachment to the um, uh, fox surprise. And this is called the cripriform plate for uh, basically the, um, um, the olfactory nerve. And this is called the cripriform plate. Okay. And moving backward a little bit to the middle cranial fossa, as you can see here, uh, this is the temporal bone. And if you remember, we said that temporal bone is formed of, we said that the temporal uh, bone is formed of uh, as a petrous part. So this is the petrous part of the temporal bone and the squamous part, which is right there. And it has three processes, the zygomatic one for the zygomatic arch and the styloid and the mastoid process, right? So you can imagine that the metacranial fossa is bounded by the superior border of the petrous part of the temporal bone, all right, and anteriorly is the lesser wing of the sphenoid, laterally the squamous part of the temporal bone, and medially, basically, you will have the cella tersica um, on, on each side, but basically the whole area, the butterfly area, is the uh, sort of the middle cranial fossa, okay? And this contains the temporal lobe, and here, it will have the cavernous sinus on both sides, and the pituitary will be present here. A few structures in the middle to identify. This is called the anterior clonoid process, and this is called the middle cranial process will be sort of here, 
and this is the posterior clinoid process. And this represents attachment to the tintorium uh, cerebelli. Uh, 40 is called the chiasmatic groove, and um, you have uh, 38 in the cella tersica, and 45 is the tuperculum cella, and 8 is the dorsum cella. So again, uh, this is chiasmatic groove, and 45 is the tuperculum cella, and 38 is the cella tersica, and 8 is the dorsum cella, and 4 is something called the clivus, all right, the clivus. 39 is where the internal carotid artery lies. I'm sure this will be explained in the um, uh, vascular anatomy, uh, and you have here, this is where the internal carotid artery lies on both sides of the petrus uh, of, of sorry of the cella tersica and that's inside the cavernous sinus on each side okay uh, you have lots of foramina here as we explained um, and I'm sure it was explained um, in the last uh, few minutes uh, you have here this is foramen oval foramen spinosum foramen rotundum and foramen lastrum and foramen magnum and hypoglossal canal and jugular foramen and the internal acoustic meatus uh, right there and uh, finally this is the posterior cranial fossa and it's surrounded by 21 which is the superior part of the petrous part of the temporal bone and backwardly you have the squamous part of uh, the um, uh, occipital bone and then in the base you have the clivus part and also the um, uh, condyloid part of the squamous bone and the basilar part, of, sorry, condyloid part and basilar part of the occipital bone, and that will be the posterior cranial fossa. Um, I'm going to explain this later on, but very, very quickly, there is something called the tentorium cerebelli. It will have a free border and then attach a border. So the attach a border will be some sort of like that, just right here, all right? And uh, the f this is the, sorry, the free border, that's the free border. And the attached border will be sort of coming all the way backwardly. So it's going to form like a tent over the um, structures in the posterior cranial fossa. And this is called the tentorium uh, cerebelli. All right. So it has a free border right there and then attached border attached all the way to these structures. Okay. So this is the tentorium cerebelli and it will be explained later on. Uh, and also very, very quickly as well. Um, looking at the base of the skull from the external uh, surface, um, as you can see here, a uh, few important structures. Uh, we didn't mention the vomer uh, early, so um, remember when we talked that there is the anterior nasal apertia, this is the posterior nasal apertia, and this is the vomer bone. What I would like you to know here, uh, this is the um, foramen magnum, hypoglossal canal, and this is the jugular foramen, carotid canal, and foramen oval, foramen spinosum, and also this is foramen lastrum, and this is the stylomastoid foramen. Remember, this is the mastoid process, 26, and the mastoid notch is right there, and this is the stylomastoid foramen number 24, as it was explained before, all right? Uh, and of course, we talked about the temporal bone with its um, sort of accessory or its um, um, processes, okay? Uh, I th I'm sure this is explained, so you can just go through it again uh, through the previous uh, 12 minutes of uh, the video. But when we go to the inferior surface of the skull, you can identify here that this is foramen magnum, and this is the um, hypoglossal canal, as you can see the exit from here. And when you zoom in to this one, that will be the carotid canal, and here will be the jugular foramen, and this is foramen oval. As you zoom in, you will find that uh, this is uh, foramen oval, this one, and this is foramen lastrum, so foramen oval, foramen lastrum, foramen spinosum, and uh, maybe here, this is carotid canal, just right there, carotid canal for the internal cord artery, and internal jugular foramen will be sort of... Um, uh, right there, this is the internal jugular uh, foramen or the jugular foramen to be more clear.
This part was pretty much explained before, but we're going to go through it again quickly. So to identify the three cranial fossae and its contents, you can see here, starting by this one, that um, this is the anterior cranial fossa, and it's related, the boundaries are the anterior clinoid posteriorly, and the lesser wing of the sphenoid as well, and the frontal bone anteriorly, and the floor is formed by the orbital part of the frontal bone. Remember, the um, upper boundary of the orbit was the frontal bone. And also, you have the foramina for the cripriform pl plate and the crest agalli, and this is the frontal crest, all right? Remember, this represents the attachments for the fox cerebri, okay? So all of this is the sphenoid bone, and you can identify um, that these are the boundaries for the anterior cranial fossa, so anterior clinoid, lesser wing of the sphenoid, and the frontal bone, the orbital part of the frontal bone represents the floor, cripriform plate, and crest agalli as well, and it contains the frontal lobe, ethmoid bone, uh, uh, sorry, it contains the frontal lobe, okay? In terms of the middle cranial fossa, uh, as you can see, this uh, butterfly shape, so anteriorly, it will be related to the anterior clinoid process and the lesser wing of the sphenoid, same thing, laterally related to the squamous part of the petrous, sorry, of the temporal bone, and posteriorly the superior part of the petrous bone and also the dorsum cella, as you can see here. Remember the structure that we quickly mentioned, this is anterior clinoid process, you have the chiasmatic sulcus or chiasmatic groove, and tuperculum cella, and this is cella tersica, and this is dorsum cella, and then you have here foramen oval, foramen spinosum, foramen lastrum will be sort of here, as you can see. And this is the petrous part of temporal bone. And the purple one is the squamous part of the temporal bone. And that's the metacranial fossa. It contains the temporal lobe and also the caverna sinus on both sides and the pituitary in the middle. All right. Finally, you have the posterior cranial fossa. As you can see, this is the petrous part of the temporal bone. And this is the um, basically the squam the squamous and also the basilar and the condylar part of the occipital bone representing the other boundary. And also, of course, you have the mastoid process on both sides as well. So that will be the boundary, the posterior cranial fossa, and it contains the brain stem and the occipital lobe. All right, the brain stem and uh, sorry and the cerebellum, brain stem and the cerebellum. Uh, part of the contents of the posterior cranial fossa. The skull bones, we have multiple bones forming the skull. They are connected together by an irrigated structure that's called the suture. So by the first bone from the front is called the frontal bone. And this is the parietal bone. And of course, this is the mandible, quite easy, not part of the skull, but just to get rid of it. On the back, you have the occipital bone, number seven, all right? And uh, from the front, or the facial skeleton, you have two important bones, and this includes the maxillary bone, number five, and the zygomatic bone bone number six okay and you can have a, inside the eye cavity you can find here this bone which is called the lacrimal bone uh, one of the big bones which is formed of multiple uh, small bones are connected together already and um, uh, it's around two bones and also three processes is a temporal bone and when this temporal bone has multiple processes as I mentioned one of these processes are the zygomatic process to this one and the styloid process right there and also the mastoid process you have mastoid styloid and also the zygomatic process, of course, because it's going to the zygomatic bone. And then this yellow bone, which is number three, is called the greater wing of a sphenoid. It's part of this. In terms of the question that can come up in the exam, is the first one is about the terium. And the terium is a structure that uh, connects between four different bones. This includes the frontal bone, the greater wing of the sphenoid, the squamous part of the temporal bone, which is right there, and also the parietal. So the terion has very important clinical significance, and this significance includes, it represents multiple approaches in brain surgery, and this includes the terional approach to be able to access the anterior circulation of the brain. It's also important because the middle meningeal artery runs on the inner surface of this terion, and of course injury to the middle meningeal artery can lead to extradural 
hematoma. The other question that can be asked would be about the styloid process. In the styloid process, as you can see, it's part of the temporal bone and it has multiple muscles attached to it. And the muscles are styloglossus, stylopharyngeus, and the stylohyoid muscle. Of course, this is the external auditory meatus this part. To be able to get a context about these questions, here are the mock tests for the head and neck anatomy, starting by the terion. What is the definition of the terion? It's the medium between four different bones. This includes the frontal, parietal, temporal, and the greater wing sphenoid. The estimated location is usually two finger breadth above the zygomatic arch and a thumb breadth behind the frontal process of zygomatic bone. The clinical significance uh, as I mentioned, the metameningeal artery runs on the inner surface of the terion and its injury can lead to extradural hematoma and it represents multiple brain approaches, specifically the terional approach, to be able to reach the um, anterior circulation of the brain. The layers you go through while doing a terional approach or a uh, bare hole at the terion, this includes the skin, the connective tissue, Ponyrosis and loose connective tissue as well. The difference here is the temporalis muscle and then the pericranium. Basically, you will find all the other structures apart from the temporalis anywhere in the, in the scalp, but in this area, the temporal bone will be there. Stylo process and muscles attached to it, it's another question. And the muscles are stylohyoid, styloglossus, and the stylopharyngeus. To look in a little bit more detail about the bones of the skull, this is the sagittal section identifying the same bones that were identified in the other section. Starting by number one, this is the sphenoid bone with its smaller parts. So starting by, this is the greater wing of the sphenoid and this is the lesser wing of the sphenoid. As you can see here, this is an empty space. It's called the sphenoid air sinus and it's obviously inside the sphenoid bone. As you can see, the frontal bone is right there, and it has a frontal ear sinus in the center as well. Green is stayed the same, and this is the maxillary bone. Number three is the ethmoid bone. Five is called vomer, and six is called the palatine bone. Seven, of course, is the occipital bone, and eight is the temporal bone, and nine is the parietal bone. As you can see here, there is a big impression of an artery on the inner side of the terion, and this is called the middle meningeal artery. As you can see here, this is the terion formed by four bones, parietal, frontal, greater ring of the sphenoid, and also the squamous part of the temporal bone. This is another view for the skull bones when we're looking from the inferior surface. And this is, of course, the teeth, and you can see um, the maxillary bone uh, still in the same color, connected with the zygomatic bone here, number two. And the um, number four will be the temporal bone with its different parts, which we mentioned multiple times. Of course, it has three processes. This is the zygomatic process, and here you have the mastoid process and the styloid process and we mentioned the muscles attached to the styloid process as well. This is the external auditory meatus and that's of course the mandibular fossa. Mandibular. Um, the big bone in the inferior part of the skull will be the occipital bone as you can see here. There are different parts of it. This is the external occipital protuberance. External occipital protuberance. All right. And this is foramen magnum and we're going to explain this later on and it's actually explained in the previous videos you can watch them foramen magnum and this is the condylar part or the occipital condyle or the condylar part of the occipital bone and that's the basilar part of the occipital bone there are lots of foramina here um, those will definitely be explained uh, later on or already explained in previous videos you can watch them uh, as you can see here this is the stylomastoid foramen Right there, stylomastoid foramen. This is foramen oval. Foramen is spinosum, just very close to it. That's foramen lacerum, right there. And this is carotid canal. 
all right, carotid canal. And that's, of course, for him and lacerum on the other. We've explained before the temporal bone and that is formed of a squamous part and three processes. You can see the process here, this one, it is a zygomatic process. This is a styloid process and this is a mastoid process. We also mentioned that it has a fossa here that is called the mandibular fossa. And this is where the head of the mandible is going to articulate to form the mandibular joint. In this photo, you can see that the head of the mandible is number one and this is the articulating part of the mandibular joint, of course, to the condyloid process. So the mandibular joint is a synovial hinge joint, which is formed by articulation between the head of the mandible on one side and the mandibular fossa and the articular tubercle on the other side. The joint is supported by multiple ligaments, which we are going to demonstrate on this diagram. Starting by the structures that's forming the joint, we're going to start from here. Number eight is the head of the mandible. Number seven is the articular tubercle. And number six is the articular disc. Number five is the mandibular fossa. So as you can see, the articulation is between the mandibular fossa, articular tubercle on one side, and the head of the mandible on the other side. There is a disc in between, which is called the articular disc, and that separates the joint space into two potential spaces, as you can see, one superior and one inferior. Inferior. Might be even more clear on this diagram. You can see this is the head of the mandible, mandibular fossa, articular tubercle, and this is the articular disc to form a synovial hinge joint. To add some more ligaments that might be related to the mandibular joint, you can see three ligaments here. Starting by number two is a lateral temporal mandibular ligament. Three is a sphenomandibular ligament between the sphenoid bone and the mandible. And four is a stylomandibular ligament, of course, between the styloid process and the mandible as well. This will leave us with one, which is the joint capsule. The exam questions might be related to one, the movement of the mandibular joint to the type of the mandibular joint and also the structures forming, forming the mandibular joint. We talked about the structures, that is the mandibular fossa, articular tubercle, and the disc in between and the head of the mandible below. Type, it's a synovial hinge joint. The movement of the mandible can include protraction, retraction, side to side movement, and the gliding movement, and opening and closing as well. You can see six different types of movement. You might also be asked about the muscles causing these movements, which is explained before in multiple videos and will. In this video, I'm going to explain about the sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is a big part of the metacranial fossa and they share a boundary of the anterior cranial fossa as well. It's formed of a body and two wings, all right? Body and two wings. It has lots of foramina and, of course, the cella tessica. So let's demonstrate that here. So, of course, that will be the body of the sphenoid. As you can see here, the whole area is called the body of the sphenoid. And you have two wings. This is the lesser wing, as you can see here on both sides. Uh, that's the lesser wing. And then you also have the greater wing of the sphenoid bone, which is just the one behind it. So that would be the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. It has lots of structures here which we need to uh, sort of identify them. It will have lots of processes, lots of foramina and also the um, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about the cella tessica and the chiasmatic sulcus as well. So if we look here, so the yellow <coughs> excuse me, the yellow area here represent the anterior clonoid process. So this is the anterior clonoid process. As you can look here, there is a very small bit here that's called the middle clonoid process. And of course, that part will be the posterior clonoid process. Okay, so to demonstrate it here, one is the anterior clonoid process, and two is the middle clonoid process, and three is the posterior clonoid process. Of course, we talked about four at uh, the lesser wing of the sphenoid, and five will be the greater wing of the sphenoid. Uh, when you have a mark uh, marking this area, that will be the body of the sphenoid, body of the sphenoid bone. And look in here, um, this is called the anterior limbus, the anterior limbus of the sphenoid bone. 
anterior limbus of the sphenoid bone. And uh, that depression just below the anterior limbus is called the chiasmatic sulcus. The chiasmatic sulcus just below the anterior limbus. And um, the last part here, this is called the dorsum cella. So to summarize what we mentioned so far, you have the anterior colonoid process, number one, or actually let me just write them, the anterior colonoid process, and this is the middle colonoid process, and this is the posterior colonoid process. The whole thing is called the body, and this part here is called the anterior limbus, and this area, the depression, is called a chiasmatic sulcus, and the whole area down there is called the cella tersica, and this is the dorsum cella, and to <clears throat> finish up the, the cella tersica area, you will have here as well, this part will be that tuperculum cella. So tuperculum cella, cella tersica, and uh, dorsum cella as well. You can, now we're moving on to foramina, you will have a big foramen in the greater wing that is called foramen oval and just close to it is called foramen spinosum and uh, again you will also have foramen rotundum just right there, foramen rotundum. So you have three foramina and of course, as well, we have three processes, anterior colonoid, metacolonoid, posterior colonoid, and the three foramina is foramen rotundum, foramen oval, and foramen spinosum. You have also the anterior limpus, the chiasmatic sulcus, tuberculum cella, and cella tersica, and also the dorsum cella. And the whole area here is called the body of the sphenoid. So as you can see here, we covered this one. We covered this, this, and this and this area and this area. So we're left with this part. So this is called planum sphenoidal. Planum sphenoidal, all right? So in this one, uh, this is foramen spinosum, which we mentioned it early. And this is a canal called the Vedian canal. It carries an artery, Vedian canal. That is the greater wing of the sphenoid, and this is the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone, and this is the planum, the sphenoidal, and that is the cella tersica, and this will be the tuberculum cella, and we're gonna cover this on the next video. This is another view of the sphenoid bone, and we're looking slightly infra superior. Um, as you can see here, and that's why you can see an important fissure here, which is called the superior orbital fissure, all right? The superior orbital fissure. Um, so let's cover the same structures again, but this is a different view and it might be confusing. So you have here, this is the anterior clonoid process. That's the anterior clonoid process. And as you can see here, this is the big groove and we covered it before in the first video. And this is a carotid, groove um, of the sphenoid bone, the carotid groove of the sphenoid bone. And here, this is the dorsum cella, and it might be confusing, and now we're gonna imagine it. So remember, we talked about the planum, sphenoidal, planum, sphenoidal, and we talked about the chiasmatic sulcus, which was just around here, and the anterior limbus, which was about here, and this is the cella tersica, and that will be the dorsum cella. And of course, you can imagine that this area will be the posterior colonoid process. Posterior colonoid process. So in short, this is the dorsum cella. The dorsum cella. And of course, in this image, you can see multiple other foramina. And these foramina, as you can imagine here, this is foramen rotundum. There is foramen rotundum. And we talked about the superior orbital fissure. And you will have foramen oval just right there. Foramen oval. And that will be the Vedian canal.
Vedian canal. We're going to cover them again. Uh, but look in here, this is the lesser wing of the sphenoid bone. And this is the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. And um, again, it, it, this is sort of called the infratemporal fossa. I don't need to worry about it. This is just the greater wing of the sphenoid. Uh, and this is the articulation between the sphenoid and the occipital bone. So you can call it a sphenooccipital articulation. Articulation between the sphenoid and occipital bone. Superior orbital fissure, as we mentioned. And this is the Vedian canal. The Vedian canal. And that should be it for the sphenoid bone. In this video, I'm going to explain the skull base anatomy, showing lots of the foramina in the skull base and lots of the important structures that come in the exam as well. Uh, to get the best out of this video, try to pose and answer the structure that are lined into uh, or colored into a yellow color, and then test yourself um, by finding out about the answer. The whole area right there is called the cella, and the yellow part in the front is called the tuperculum cella. And this part is called the cella tersica, and the posterior part of it is called the dorsum cella. All right. The next image, you can see a big bone right there, is called the petrous part of the temporal bone. So right there will be supposedly the temporal bone. Temporal bone has two parts, basically. These are the squamous part and the petrous part. Part, and also it has three processes and you can see the zygomatic process and also the mastoid uh, process and the styloid process so two parts and three processes this is the petrous part of the um, temporal bone the petrous part of temporal bone as you can see on the other side it's not really regular it has some prominence or eminence coming out from it and also some depressions which we're gonna talk about in a second. And of course, as here, like a very thin part, that again, we're gonna talk about it. So for example, here, try to identify this, and this is called the trigeminal prominence, which is related to the trigeminal nerve. The next image you can see here, this is a bit of a depression. It's called the meato from the word ear, depression. Moving forward, this is called the meatal eminence. Meatal eminence. And again, moving forward, this is this part is called the tegmen tympani. Tegmen tympani. Okay. So that, it, that covers the petrous part of the temporal bone. If I'm going to summarize it to you on the other side, the whole part is the petrous part of the temporal bone. You have a few other structures. This is the trigeminal prominence, and then a depression in the middle called the meatal depression, and then you have the meatal prominence, and then you have the tegmen tympani, and the tegmen tympani is characteristically a very thin structure, and it might be responsible for uh, transmission of infection from the middle ear all the way up to the temporal lobe, which lies down there, and causing a temporal abscess. Moving forward here, we're going to cover a few of the foramina. This green bit here on both sides, these are part of the carotid canal. So these are the carotid canal. Of course, it's uh, more clear when you see it from the external surface of the skull base. Uh, but this is where the carotid artery enters and it passes in front of that foramen and it descends all the way up causing a depression as you can see this depression here or impression just behind the clinoid process this is called the clinoid process and um, ascends all the way up so just to summarize to you this structure I feel it's a bit confusing you have here this is the carotid canal and there is a foramen here which is called foramen lastrum. And you have an impression here. This is the carotid artery. 
impression. And this part on both sides, of course, is called the clinoid, anterior clinoid. All right. And there is a canal here that's called the optic canal. So as you can imagine, the artery, the course of the internal carotid artery will come out from the carotid canal. It doesn't really, it's not really transmitted through a formal lastrum, but just bypass or pass over formal lastrum. It sends all the way up vertically inside. This is about 90 degree curve inside the cavernous sinus, which lies on both sides and just behind the anterior clinoid and will be related to the optic nerve, which will be right here as well, all right? Entering the optic canal. All right, I hope that's clear. So coming to this one, which we've covered, this is foramen lastrum. Moving to the next one, this is the carotid artery impression, which we covered before. And moving forward, that is part of the cavernous sinus on both sides. Cavernous sinus, and of course the carotid artery will be inside the cavernous sinus at some point, and it's called the cavernous part of the carotid artery, of course. You can see there is a big bone behind there. It's called just uh, below, of course, the vitreous part of temporal bone will be the occipital bone. The occipital bone has multiple parts of it. This is called the yellow part here. It's called the clival part of the occipital bone. You have also a condyloid part and the basilar part of the occipital bone, which will be covered later on. So here, this is the clival part of occipital bone. Of course, that's occipital bone. All right. And that middle part of the clival part of the occipital bone is called the clivus. And it's characteristically can be, um, can, has a can have a fracture um, is part of the, skull, the middle of the cranial fossa skull base fracture and can lead to injury of some nerves, specifically the third or the sixth nerve as well. And the seventh nerve, of course, with the petrous part is involved. Look in here, um, we mentioned early, you have um, the skull base divided into anterior cranial fossa, and these are the boundaries of the anterior cranial fossa, and also the middle cranial fossa, and these are the boundaries of the middle cranial fossa and also posterior cranial fossa. And these are the boundaries of the posterior cranial fossa. These are covered before in um, different parts of the videos. Look in here, this is the cripriform plate in the anterior cranial fossa. Cripriform plate. There is a prominence here, as you can see, this is called the crestagalli. Crestagalli, and it does represent the attachment for the fox surpli. surpli. We covered this part before. This is the cella, right there. So that is the cella, and this is the tuberculum cella anteriorly, and that will be the dorsum cella. Lots of other foramina. This is an oval in shape, so that will be foramen. Oval. Of course, you need to revise the contents of these foramina, which were discussed multiple times before in other videos. Identifying this very small foramen, closer to foramen oval is called foramen spinosum. And on this one, you can see there is a big foramen here. Let me get the ricotta. There is a big foramen here, it's called foramen magnum. That's relates to the big foramen. And there is a small opening inside foramen magnum that is called hypoglossal canal, containing hypoglossal nerve. So easy when you think about it. Again, um, we talked about the petrous part of temporal bone, if you remember that. 
So basically, to summarize, on the tip of the petrous part of the temporal bone, you will have the carotid canal. Just in front of it, you will have foramen lastrum. You have lots of depression in the thin part and also lots of prominences. So this is the tegment tympani. This is the uh, meatal uh, eminence and meatal depression and the trigeminal prominence as well. And there is an opening here in the petrous part of temporal bone called the internal acoustic meatus which contains the vestibular cochlear nerve and of course the fascia nerve as well internal acoustic meatus this one you can see a small opening in here which will be a foramen as well on both sides so the way i think about it it's sort of an extension so you have a foramen here called foramen magnum related to the hypoglossal canal right there, and another one right there, that would be the jugular foramen. And of course, from the name, it suggests that it is related to the jugular vein, and 9, 10, 11 nerves. We mentioned this before, this is the cella tersica, and this is the tuberculum cella, and this is the dorsum cella. This one, as you can see, we talked about the jugular foramen, and that will be the sigmoid sinus. Of course, you know that the extension of that sigmoid sinus will be the jugular um, vein. All right, so this is the sigmoid sinus. Moving forward, you can see the transverse sinus will be like that. There is a good video which I explained about the sinuses. So this is the transverse sinus on both sides and that will continue as the sigmoid sinus and then will continue as the jugular vein. Again, this is the metacranial fossa. You can see a foramen here, the green one. Try to identify it and talk about the contents of this foramen. It could be a question in the exam. And this foramen or a fascia is called the superior orbital fascia, superior orbital fascia. It contains lots of nerves, uh, including, of course, think about it, what nerves will need to go from here to go to the eye. So you will have the third and also the fourth, and the sixth nerve. You also have the lacrimal and the nasociliary and the frontal nerve, all right? And we'll have some ophthalmic veins as well. Moving forward, you can see uh, here there is uh, something called the trochlea, all right, the trochlea. And this one, it's, a, it's like a quick summary on what we mentioned. Um, so you can see from the front, this is the cripriform plate, and this bit is the cresta galley. And this is the anterior clinoid process, anterior clinoid process. There is a canal very close to it, it's called the optic canal. And then you have the tuperculum cella, and then you have the cella tersica, and then the dorsum cella, and then it goes all the way down as the clivus. All right. And then you have here, this is foramen oval, and this is foramen spinosum, or foramen spinosum. Of course, you can see even the petrous part of the temporal bone with the internal acoustic meatus right here and the jugular foramen right there, all right? Of course, this is foramen magnum and here there is the hypoglossal canal, okay? So you can see here, this is the optic canal. Superior orbital fascia will be sort of here. Of course, we can't see it in a 2D image. And uh, that, that will be the foramen, oval, foramen, spinosum. There are other structures here like foramen lastrum. Can you see, you can see it on the other side as an extension of the petrous part of temporal bone. That's a carotid artery impression. While it's coming out from the carotid canal right there, that will be the carotid artery impression and or a carotid groove and on both sides of the cella 
you will find the cavernous sinus. Again, you can test yourself here. I'll write a few numbers for you. One, and that will be the crepe reform plate. Two, cresta galley. Three, anterior clonal process. Four, that is optic canal. Five, cuperculum cella. Six, cella tasica. Seven, dorsum cella. Eight, foramen oval. Nine, foramen spinosum. Ten, that is foramen lateral. Eleven, carotid groove. And let's say twelve, that will be cavernous sinus. Thirteen, that will be the clivus. If we highlight that for you, petrous part of temporal bone. If we highlight this, maybe as 14, jugular foramen, 15, foramen magnum, and 16 as hypoglossal canal. These are just a further sort of consolidation of what we mentioned. This is called the ethmoid bone, and we talked about the cripriformal plate, which are the openings, and the crest again here, but the whole thing is called the ethmoid bone. And that will be the frontal bone, and here this will be the squamous part of temporal bone. We mentioned that, of course, this is the petrous part, and above that, that will be the squamous part of petrous bone, just close to foramen ovale and foramen spinosum, as we mentioned before. That is clearly is the petrous part of temporal bone. And that is, of course, the whole occipital bone. It's just showing you the bones forming the, um, the base of the skull including frontal bone, ethmoid bone, and of course you have the sphenoid bone in the middle, including the greater and lesser wing of the sphenoid. This is the lesser wing and you have the greater wing right there. You also have the squamous part of the temporal bone, the petrous part of temporal bone and occipital bone. Small foramen right there, and that will be foramen lastrum, which was mentioned before multiple times. And here you have a groove for the carotid artery. It's called the carotid groove. All right. Next one is something called the lingla. I would just skip it, to be honest. It's not really related or needed. And then that's, of course, the cavernous sinus, cavernous sinus. I mentioned this multiple time. It's called the anterior colonoid process, ACP, anterior colonoid process. And that will be the middle clinoid process. Not really needed, very subtle. So it's called middle clinoid process. Next one is a bit easy. You can see a small canal in there and there as well. And that will be the optic canal. And moving forward after optic canal, this is something called planum sphenodal. Planum sphenodal. All right, sphenoidal, sphenoidal, sorry. Planum sphenoidal. Okay, it's basically the roof of the sphenoid bone. So we have here, that's the roof of the sphenoid bone and the uh, wings and the processes coming out from the sphenoid bone, which is forming, of course, part of the base of the skull. That would be the tuperculum cella. Further details here, tuperculum cella. And then this is the cella tessica. I assume that will be the dorsum cella right there. 
but the whole thing is the clival part of the occipital bone, or you can just call it simply the clivus. All right, the clivus. And that would be, of course, the dorsum cella. Dorsum cella. And that would be the posterior clonoid process. So just to get the clonoid process out of your way, you have here anterior clonoid process, and that one middle clonoid process, and that one posterior clonoid process. Let's use different colors. This is the tuperculum cella, and this is the cella thoracica, and that is the dorsum cella. It's actually included in this part as well. Dorsum cella, and the whole thing right there is called the clivus or the clival part of the occipital bone. Right? Or oh, that's the clivus as well. Okay. There is a fissure here, it's called petroclival fissure. When you think about it, it's between the petrous part of temporal bone and the clivus, so that's why it's called the petroclival fissure. The commonest foramen here is called the jugular foramen, and I told you how I think about it. I think about foramen magnum hypoglossal canal, and then a big foramen closer to them is called the jugular foramen, right? And after the jugular foramen, there is, it's a, it's a, so basically the jugular foramen is sort of two parts. So this is called the petrous, the petrosal part of the jugular foramen, but to be honest, I wouldn't, subclassify them into two parts, all right? Of course, if this is the petrosal part, so this is the sigmoid part. Sigmoid part and petrosal part of jugular foramen. And the small bit that is um, sort of dividing them into two foramina or two small foramina, which is this one, is called the infrajagular process of temporal bone. Infrajagular process of temporal bone. Right? So that's actually a fourth process. You will mention the, the temporal bone as um, two parts and three processes, and that's a fourth one. Sometimes it's not actually present. This is internal acoustic meatus. Uh, easy, we mentioned that it contained the 7th and 8th nerve. 7th and 8th nerve. This foramen, we haven't mentioned till now, is called foramen rotundum. So the foramen in this one, which are very clear, this one is foramen ovale, spinosum, rotundum, superior orbital fascia, optic canal on both sides, Foramen lathrum, carotid canal will be closed at, jugular foramen, hypoglossal canal, and foramen magnum. We'd like you to look at this one, try to identify all the structures. We talked about planum sphenodal, tuperculum cella, and also three clinoid process, anterior clinoid process, metal clinoid process, and also the posterior clinoid process. Okay, you have the cella tersica dorsum cella, the clivus, the petroclival fissure, which is right there, and lots of other foramina. I will talk a little bit more in detail about different bones, but that will be in another video.